So last time we we did uh, verses 10 and 11. We kind of finished up in verse 11 for this is the message which we have heard from the beginning, which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Pointing us back to what he says in verse 10. This is how you know the, the, the children of God uh, and the children of the devil, the one who... Um, this is how you know the difference between the children of God and the children of the devil. He says the one who does not practice righteousness is not of God, has not been born of God, um, nor the one who does not love his brother. And, he's, and then so he connects that. Righteous living means you are loving the brethren, you're loving others, you're loving other Christians, you're showing that, you're displaying that love towards other Christians, right? And he says this is the message which you heard from the beginning. That we should love one another, and and we took the the view that um, it, it seems to refer to the commandment when, that Jesus gave. Uh, there's a new dynamic to that because at first in the Old Testament in Leviticus, love your neighbors yourself. Jesus took that same commandment and then um, gave a new emphasis to it because he says this is how they're going to know that you're disciples of me. This is how you're going to know you're disciples of Jesus, uh, disciples of Christ. As you love one another, as you love the brotherhood, as you are loving those within the church, Christians, fellow Christians, they will know that. Um, love amongst brethren displays a person uh, who is truly a follower of Jesus, who obeys God and his word. And then, um, so, so we ended there in verse 11, and then we'll, we'll step into verse 12 at this point. That we should love one another, not as Cain who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous. He did not love his literal brother, as Cain, <clears throat> and that was shown by his action of murdering him. So John's taken us all the way back to Genesis chapter 4, a, a direct reference to the Old Testament here. So what is he basically saying about Cain in reference to being born of God, in reference to being a child of God? What is he saying about Cain? Who's not one of those. So in other words, who is he a child of? Satan. Satan. Satan the devil. So he's, he's just painting a contrast. Cain was a child of the devil. It was Cain, it's, excuse me, it was who Cain was his action gave proof of his nature. Um, what's, that, what's the lifeline that we have in the Gospel of John that we looked at before? We've, we've looked at it a couple of times, I think. What lifeline uh, passage in John do we look at that connects us with a murderer, with the evil one? Do you remember that place in the Gospel of John? In what chapter in the Gospel of John? That's our lifeline. A lifeline to understanding 1 John. John 10. Uh, close. John 10 comes up later. It's actually John chapter 8, but John 10 also comes up later. If you go to John chapter 8, John chapter 8, really the... This whole section starting in verse 31 and following, but if you start in verse 42, <clears throat> notice what Jesus says. He said to them, if God were your father, he would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? Because you cannot hear my word. You're of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the... So who is he talking about here? A murderer from the beginning. Who is Jesus talking about here? Cain. He's talking about Cain. From the very beginning, he was a murderer. So he's going back to the beginning of, of mankind, of humanity. He's saying from the beginning, he was a murderer. So, so wait a minute. I, I thought Cain was the one who was a murderer. <laughs> You get what he's trying to say here? Jesus, and here in the Gospel of John? And then connect that with 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Not as Cain was the evil one and slew his brother. So 
So Jesus is saying, um, you are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. And John's saying, yes, he was a murderer from the beginning. It was Satan who murdered Abel, and he used Cain to do it, because Cain was of his father, the devil. You see what he's doing? Just the connection you see here? And then notice, again, going back to John, um, John chapter 8. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and a, and a father of lies. And the father of lies, excuse me. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? Notice, he who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear, because you're not of God. Oh, what do, you, what do you see here? What, what, what is Jesus trying to say? She's starting here in verse 47. And, and that same theme is given to us in 1 John 3, 12 and following. What is Jesus trying to say here in reference to his, re, excuse me, his audience when he says, He who is of God hears the words of God. Who are the ones that hear God's words? The children. The children. God's chosen, God's people, the one who's, who is already of God, those are the ones that hear God's word. This reason you don't hear them, because you're not of God. Why don't people believe? In the long run, in the big scheme of things, why is it that some people do not believe? Well, God has not chosen them to embrace him. The reason why people don't, it's not the other way around. You're not, you're not to, well, you believe that to make you chosen. No, 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 no. When you're chosen, you will believe. That's what Jesus is saying. Uh, Romney brought up John chapter 10. Um, if you go to John chapter 10, look at verse 25. John 10, 25. Jesus answered them. Because they said, how long will you keep us in suspense? suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us. I told you. And you don't believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. But why don't people believe? What does Jesus say in verse 26? But you do not believe. Why? Not my sheep. Because you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. I give eternal life to them. Notice, it, it's, the reason why people don't believe is because they're not his sheep. Okay, so if it goes back to who someone is. What do we need God to do to us? What does he need to change? Our nature, our heart. God needs to change our nature, our heart. He needs to do that in us. So see, if, if either you're Cain or you're Abel, and, and, and some people, they look like they're Cain's, but they can become Abel's. We just don't know, right? We don't know who those elect people are. Like Paul. Like, like Paul. That's a great example. Paul, he seemed like to be a Cain, and, and some of the things he was doing, he was Cain, right? Mm -hmm. But then God changed his heart, right? Mm -hmm. God's in the business of changing hearts. So that way, people who are Cain and should be Cain's and should be condemned because they're Cain's, they become Abel, which we're going to look at Abel in just a second. But, um, Jesus is making a statement, and, and going back to now 1 John, if you go back there, John is making the same statement. He was of the evil one, and he slew his brother. This is who Cain was, and his actions gave proof to who he really was. So now, why is... Why is John bringing this up to his readers? What's going on? What's the situation? What's taking place? <coughs> the people that are in the church that are the Gnostics really aren't believers. They're starting to move away, starting to go away from them. They're not, their actions speak louder than their words, right? They're professing this, but it's not really happening. They're professing that, but that's not really taking place in their lives. <coughs> um, that's why we need a heart change. We need God to change our hearts. Um, notice the next part of the verse, of verse 12. 
Again, we're back in 1 John 3 and verse 12. And for what reason did he slay him? What reason did he kill him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. The reason why he's killed him was because his deeds, his actions were evil. And notice the contrast. But the actions, the livelihood of his brother was righteous. He was the one who practiced sin. He was the one who practiced lawlessness. He was the one who practiced evil. Some more chairs? Any other chairs? Okay. I think there's not. <laughs> He was the one, Cain was the one to practice sin. He was the one to practice lawlessness. Cain was the one to practice evil. Remember that, that's taking us back to uh, 3 verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. His deeds truly display the nature of his heart. Yeah, Derek, what are you going to Yeah, we see that example. I don't know if I'm going to, you're going to bring it up later, but going back to Genesis chapter 3, um, Abel um, did the right thing because it came from his father and mother and taught them he must bring up a blood sacrifice. For Cain brought in, didn't I want to do it my way? Mm -hmm. And uh, there was more to it than that. But anyway, so that is a very good example. Of we have a blood sacrifice, and that was Christ on the cross. And when we accept Jesus, that's our blood sacrifice, mm -hmm. and God is well pleased. Yeah, there is, obviously, there was something that was communicated to Cain and Abel, maybe to Adam and Eve at that point. Mm -hmm. We don't know because nothing is made known to us. But it does say in Genesis 4 that <clears throat> the Lord accepted uh, Abel's offering, but did not accept Cain's. Um, and there's always debate about that as to what, why it was done. Was it because of his heart? Was he, he have the right heart attitude towards Abel, but Cain didn't have the right heart, heart attitude? Or was it more of what he was offering versus uh, his heart attitude? You know, it's hard to say. But going back to Genesis 3, um, maybe somebody can read that for us, that section. Um, Daniel, you can read that section for us. Like, uh, what's that? Maybe verse 6, 7, 8. Maybe the Lord is speaking to Cain. Genesis chapter 4, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you must master it. Yeah, so Cain was warned of the danger of sin. It was crouching at the door. He didn't heed the warning. He didn't heed the warning because of who he was. So you warn, we warn people all the time. We tell them the gospel. We proclaim the gospel to them, realizing that it's not up to us to do anything. It's, it's up to God to do something in their hearts. It's up to God to be able to do something and, and change their nature. And, and this is bringing out, <clears throat> excuse me, this is bringing out Cain's very nature. He was warned about the crouching of sin. He was warned about sin coming at him, but he didn't do anything about it. And then John says, because his deeds were evil, but his brothers were righteous. Abel's deeds were righteous. Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God because he obeyed God's command. His actions were righteous and displayed that he truly was a child of God. Christians are in line, in the line of Abel. <clears throat> now, a question. If we have a new nature as followers of Christ, if we're in the line of Abel, what does this tell us about the power of sin in our lives as Christians? What does that tell us? 
it can be very damaging. It can be damaging, true. What else does that tell us? <clears throat> the, these verses, and we're kind of going into a little bit of application here. It hurts a lot of people. It's true. Well, we can overcome it. That well, you have a negative, but the positive to this is, <clears throat> and take Cain's situation. Sin is crouching at the door. You know what I'm talking about. It's almost like something's going to happen, and you can respond simply, and all of a sudden, everything gets really slow. Right? And it's like slow motion, and you can either respond the wrong way, or you can respond the right way. You ever yes. had that happen? Yeah. And you know you can just... Bah! You know, shoot your mouth off, and then all of a everything goes back into normal speed. Or you can uh, uh, respond in grace. I mean, this is, uh, and, and this goes back to what we discussed in verse 8, right in the middle. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. He might render it powerless. Uh, uh, Jesus has taken the penalty of sin away, so we will no longer face sin's penalty. But what else has he taken away? Not just sin's penalty, but what? It's power. Sin's power. So sin's power in your life. And how you respond to each other. And how you respond to certain things and situations with each other. That's, that's what God does. He, he gives us the power now. So that way what's, who we truly are coincides with our actions. Who we truly are coincides with our actions. And that's why... When you and I do something, and you do something you shouldn't do, mm. what feelings do you have? Guilt. Guilt. What else? Shame. Shame. What else? Remorse. Remorse. Regret. Fear. Right? And that's what stops, right? No, I hope not. Repentance. Well, repentance, that's true. There must be repentance, but what, sh what should come first before there's repentance? Confession. What comes before confession? How about the cross? Yeah. How about the gospel? Remind yourself of the gospel. Remind yourself of the fact that God's been gracious to you, right? You remind, you remind yourself of the fact that the penalty of sin has been broken. You remind yourself of the fact that the power of sin is broken, and then there's acknowledgement, there's confession, there's repentance. Uh, so you work through that process where, like let's say, um, you respond the wrong way to somebody. So you're able to go through the gospel and say, you know what, praise God that Jesus, when somebody came to him, he didn't respond the wrong way. He was perfect. And praise God that that even though I respond in the wrong way, his, his good response is credited to me. And praise God that my bad response to this person, Jesus, that's why Jesus had to die for that, because I'm an idiot and I respond in the wrong way, right? Mm -hmm. And then praise God that next time God gives me grace and continues to give me grace so I can respond the right way. You see how that works through that gospel process? Mm -hmm. So this is what, this is kind of, we're kind of branching out a little bit, doing some application. But there's, there's I mean, there's some real things real principles to this about how you deal with sin because I know all of us in here, you, you have responded in the wrong way towards each other in, in any way, shape, or form whoever you've done it this past week. And you can either sit in guilt and shame and fear and whatever or you can work through that process of the gospel and remind yourself how much you need grace and let God's grace work in you. Right? What's one of the reasons why John wrote 1 John? What did he say in the first part of chapter 2? Little children, I'm writing these things so that you won't what? Sin. Yeah, so you won't sin. But then what does he say? If you do sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate. Jesus Christ. He's the righteous one. He's a propitiation for us. Right? Do you praise God for that? Amen. Praise God for the gospel. He gives us grace. May God help us to have grace towards each other.
want to ask another question, get some discussion going, and then uh, I'll ask for just general feedback. <clears throat> I brought this question up two, three weeks ago or something like that. The question was, why does John want to try and point out to the Christians that they will be sinless at the time of Christ's return, but not now? Why is he trying to say, why, why does he try to point that out, that when Christ comes, then you'll be sinless, but not right now? You won't be sinless now. Why would he say that? I'm going to give him some kind of confidence, because if he's pointing out to these people over here, these, these are unbelievers, and you know because they sin. Well, believers also sin. So to, try to, to, to assure them that, look, even though you sin, so long as you know you, have, you show the pattern of righteousness and you know, occasional sin. Not. So to differentiate between um, two groups, yeah. uh, to give them assurance so that they don't think, well, I sin, so therefore I'm, I'm not of God. Uh, yeah, okay, good, good. Uh, other feedback? Why, again, why does John try to point out to the Christians that they will be sinless at the time of Christ's return, but not now? Because when Christ returns, a lot of us are going to be already dead and in heaven and have our new, you know, <clears throat> bodies or whatever. So it's a source of hope, in other words? Is that what you mean? Um, well, I think, yeah, I guess that's, that, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but not really, that's not yeah. what I was thinking, but that'll okay. work. Well, I, I don't want to make sure I'm understanding. What else? Yeah, what if, yeah. Maybe I'm not understanding. When he returns, I mean, a lot of us will already already be gone, and you know, in heaven, waiting for his return. So oh, we're yeah. not going to be sitting when we're up there. I don't think. Yeah. No, we won't be. Yes, yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Not there>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sleep it there. Okay. <laughs> because we have a sin nature, and the sin nature can't be washed away until the body dies. It's the body is the sin nature. Yes, there's that connection. It's also known as flesh, that, that remnants of sin is still inside of us. That's true. That's why that. Jesus, the God came into flesh in John 1, uh, 14. Yeah, John, the Word became flesh and dwelt in the And that he did the sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why, why, there's some good, I've uh, got some good comments. Why does John, again, want to try and point out to the Christians that they will be sinless at the time of Christ's return, but not necessarily right now? The Gnostics didn't believe that they were here in the flesh, so Jesus was in the flesh still, so they were still sinning. And they were, um, um, what's the word they used? Um, they were, I mean, they were not flesh, in the flesh they were sinning. I can't so, so, I so Gnostics, my mom brought some up, Gnostics, when they did something wrong, did they really think they were doing something wrong? No. Mm -hmm. Why? It's just the body. The body. It's, it's just the flesh. It doesn't matter. I mean, what matters is you have the knowledge. It's the spiritual union that you have with God, right? <laughs> but someday we will have that flesh again and be sinless at the same time. And that's because it will be it will be renewed. It will be glorified. But that's that's the reason why John's trying to point out to them: Look, you're going to be you're going to be sinless. Not you're going to be sinless at that time. Not now. Because everyone who practices sin practices what does he say? Lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. If these guys are doing this wrong, they're they're living a hedonistic life. No, they're not sinless. They are in lawlessness. That's, that's why he's trying to point that out now. That's why he's saying, when Christ comes, that's the time when you will be sinless. That's the time where there will be no sin at all. Will there be no lawlessness in your life? That's what he's trying to, that's one of the things he's trying to point out to them. Yeah, Peggy. I think it gives us hope because if you're a true believer, when you sin, you can really start beating yourself up. And it keeps us mm -hmm. beating ourselves up, but gives us hope. Yes. Well, there's the hope is the thing that purifies us because we're looking yes. forward to his coming and everyone that has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. So as we're looking forward to Christ's return, um, we're pursuing godliness and holiness, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, I'll stop here. Any general comments or, or thoughts or questions, whatever? It can be from up to verse 4 or whatever. 
um, or even specifically with verses 11 and 12. If not, we'll move yet to. Yeah, a couple of things that uh, seems like John was just was seeing a, his mind uh, was illuminated by the Holy Spirit and was being a good teacher and telling him the truth. And this is how it is. Regardless of what was going on, he was just setting them straight. This is how it really is. So you need to know that. When we were talking about uh, being a king back in Genesis, um, I was reading that again. And God told Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? And then he said, God's telling Cain, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And then later he says, but you must master it. So let's think of the application there, that God was telling Cain, if you do well, your countenance will be lifted up, and you must master it. The sin that you have. So, I don't know, it, I never really looked at it that way before. Do you, do you think that God was telling him that uh, you're sending yourself to hell, not me? And uh, that's what what it is today. I mean, people send themselves to hell, God doesn't. There's a lot of questions there. <laughs> <laughs> I never really looked at just that part of it before. Well, at first, what I would say in reference to that passage is, is difficult because, well, how do I say it? Not necessarily difficult. Um, revelation is progressive. So in that time with Genesis 4, there's this much revelation. Yeah. And now we can, we have right. this much revelation. So we can look back and kind right. of see this is what the Lord was trying to tell Cain. So we can kind of read into that, realizing that, you know, taking First John here, Cain, this is who Cain was. He has to master it, but he's not able to unless God gives him grace to be able to master sin. He will not be able to do that. Right. Um, in reference to the fact that people send themselves to hell, and, and God doesn't, it's actually both. Uh, people continue to rebel, and their rebellion is a thing that sends them into hell, but yet it's an action he whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So, so God sends them to hell. But people also send themselves to hell. So there, there's both aspects because you have the scripture talk about both situations. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I think that's a great observation. And even I remember doing, when we went through the book of Genesis there in chapter 4, um, really that, that whole section there in the Hebrew is just it's, it's really difficult to look at just how what the Lord was saying, translating this and that, and there in the Hebrew, sin is crouching at the door, um, you must master it. What does all that mean? There's so much that was there. Um, so it, it'd be a great study to do on your own, um, the different ways to translate that there in the Hebrew. So, good, good question. Other thoughts, or comments, or questions? Hopefully not like Tim's. <laughs> 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 You never know what you're going to get. Isn't there like a commercial or something like that? Okay, look at verse 13. Do not marvel, brethren, brethren, if the world hates you. Okay, what? <laughs> Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. Why does he bring this up? <laughs> what does this have to do with what he just said? Why does he have this statement here? I was speculating, and this may not be the case, but I was speculating that maybe the Gnostic um, teaching was not as um, offensive to the surrounding culture as the Christian teaching was, and so the Gnostics were not being persecuted perhaps as heavily as the Christians were. And so the Christians are thinking, you know, maybe they got the right teaching because they're getting along better with the society. And they think, so he's telling them, you know, don't be surprised that you're getting um, persecuted by the the pagan culture around you, that's supposed to happen. Okay. That's a long speculation. But. But, but why would he, I mean, what would be the connection, though? And, and there's there's some truth to that, but there's persecution. I mean, the world's going to hate you, okay? Uh, and maybe there was true, maybe Gnostics that were leaving, they were having more of a, well, a problem most likely, right? If you're, leave, if you're living a hedonistic life, I mean... People are going to say, all right, mi amigo, all right, I mean, hey. 
he likes to party like us too. But hey, I got the knowledge, man. I'm okay. Right? It's, it's, it's a proof <laughs> statement that the world has a fallen nature and there are devils. So that, oh, okay. So now, now there's a connection. The world has a fallen nature and they are of the devil. So there's a connection here between 12 and 13. Here's the connection. Abel obeyed God and did what God wanted him to do, right? When God's people obey God, and when God's people, as they're obeying God, what do we do when we're obeying God? What do we end up doing with darkness? We shed light on it. You shed light on it. <clears throat> Cockroaches don't like it when you shed light on them. They like to do their thing in the dark, right? So as God's people obey God and they, they're exposing the sin, what will the world, how will the world respond to them? Well, they're going to take offense and they're going to direct it upon you. They're going to bitterly oppose you. Bitterly hate you. This is exactly what Jesus said to his disciples. What's our lifeline? Gospel of John. Gospel of John. Uh, Go to John 15. Again, just to reiterate, to repeat this, um, if, you're tr if you're having a hard time trying to figure out what does John mean in 1 John, go to the Gospel of John. Because in the Gospel of John, it unpacks a lot of the same truths and same themes as the Epistle of John, 1 John. So go to John 15. Look at verse 18. What does it say? Somebody? Anybody? If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Ah. Will hate you. It hated me before it hated you. And it's going to hate you. If you're of the world, Jesus says in verse 19, the world will love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And then he says, remember the word that I said, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. All these things they'll do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. What did Jesus do to sin? What did he do to he? Oh, according Took to the away. text here. What do you do to sin here, according to the text? What do you do to sin? What do you do with these people? Oh, expose. So God, Jesus exposed the sin. So as we, as God's people, as we obey God, we're going to start exposing sin. You're going to expose people for who they really are, and how are people going to, how are people going to respond to you? They're going to hate you. They ain't going to like you. Now give me... Oh, no, 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 no. I'll go back to that. Just in verse 23, he says, He who hates me hates my father also. That's, that's a good connection. It takes us back to chapter 2 of First John. So now give me... Um, put this into practice with... Um, into a scenario, I should say. With Gnostics here in First John... Towards the end of the first century, what could be happening? The true believers, they're obeying God. Who are they exposing? The Gnostics. They're exposing Gnostics. Why? What, what were they about? What were they doing? There's heathenism. Or heathenism, excuse me. Oh, heathenism. Um, There's some he of that too, I'm sure. <laughs> 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 See, it's the same as today. There's no change. There's no difference, really. They, it's illogical because you would think the world would like people that love, do good, take care of each other, love each other, and uh, speak the truth. But they don't. They don't have the ability to see their own wickedness. Mm -hmm. You know, talk to people. No, Rebecca. You know, ask people what they believe. They will tell you, hey, man, I, I believe in Jesus. He's a good teacher. He's going to ask some really good things. I just don't like being with people anymore. 
They tell me you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, right? So narrow. You're narrow. And then ask them, say, but what do you do with the passage that would, when Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What do you, what do, you do with that? What will be the response? Right, they'll, they'll close up. Right, they'll, they'll, they, they won't like it that you're saying that. They won't like that you're exposing that. Because he's not just a really good teacher. And then you ask them, what do you do when, when Jesus said, no one can come to the Father except through me? What do you do with that? Because Jesus is saying here that you can't come to know God except through himself. What do you do with that? <coughs> See, people are very willing to embrace what you have to say as long as you don't tell them what? <laughs> they're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is for them also. <laughs> See, you believe what you believe. I believe what I believe. Hey, and we're okay. Well, a good visualization of what's going on in their heart is what they did when Stephen was telling them the truth. He was just speaking words. He wasn't hitting them. He was they said, now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. And they ran at him, screaming, and kind of visualization. covering their ears. And all he's doing is talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell you, there in Jerome, that's what you'll find. They're okay, but as soon as you start telling them, this is what it says, they shut down. You cross the line. You, you, you're telling me that I'm wrong? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you. I'm just a messenger. Wait, amen. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Interesting, the, the correlation that you have from the first century all the way to the 21st century. It's still there. Why well, people, Muslims, oh, Jesus was a good teacher. As soon as you start telling them, this is what he says, what happens? Yeah. They don't like it. From his own lips. Yeah, this is what it says. And yet even... Muslims will say, they believe in the Bible and God speaks from, his, from the Bible. They will, they will even say that. They want to be inclusive. Yes. But when it gets down to those... But when it gets down to... But what do you do with, with the words when Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. What do you do with that? Oh, that's... Like and, Mormons. And with more... I mean, any... Really, take any... When you're talking about heathenism or heathenism or Mormonism or Muslim, anything. So you start going right through the truth, this is what it says. Look, it comes down to this. We will be hated by the world. And, and it becomes even more real for these believers, for the ones he's writing to, it becomes more real for them because these people who used to be a part of them, these people who used to be there with them, they're leaving, and now they're hating them. Can you imagine that? Here's these people, they're following the Gnostic teachings. These false teachers came in and these people are following them and now there's a schism. Now we're saying, what, what's going on? We thought you were, you were with us and, it, and now there's hatred. Well, this is especially hard for young, new, immature Christians in a church. It's just like, have you ever been to a church split? You've got some of those people that are sitting there going, they're looking both ways. Going, well, now, now who's right? Which way do I go? What do I do? Yeah. Which, I mean, that's, that's a whole other yeah. gamut of things. We'll be hated by the world. So don't mark it. Don't, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Look at verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. How can we have an assurance of our salvation that we have eternal life? What does John say in this verse? How, again, here's the question. How can we have an assurance of our salvation? How can we have an assurance that we have eternal life? What does he say? In this verse. But how do you know that you've passed out of death to life? Love our brethren. You love the brethren. That's how you know. You love the brethren. The outward sign is when a person loves and cares for fellow Christians 
as a pattern, as a way of life. It's a proof of the reality of their nature, of who they are. Um, I'll write this on the board. Righteousness. Righteousness and love are inseparable. Righteous living and loving your brothers, they're inseparable. They go together. And that's why he says, he who does not love abides in death. Anyone who hates the Christian community There's the word abide again. What am I at? What verse am I in? 14? We know that. 14, into 14. Who does not love remains. Meno. Mene. Remain. What, what does remain mean? Give me some different uh, words that we've talked about with remain. Stay. Stay. Continue. Continue. Right? Okay. Living in? So somebody's abiding, staying. What do I have written down here? Um, has continued dwelling in? So he who does not love is remaining, is staying, is continually dwelling in, abiding in death. There's no way that a person who claims to be a Christian and despises the Christian community as a true believer. He or she is fooling themselves. You ever heard this before? I just love Jesus, but I don't love his church. You ever heard that before? Yeah. Or something derivative of that. Sometimes you don't even hear it, you just see it. Yeah. They just don't go to church. They, don't, they do not involve themselves in the local assembly. Not but they say church. that they love God and all this Christian talk. Yeah, I love God, yeah. But they don't go to an assembly. How, how can you display love if there's no community? I mean, how can you really see if I'm loving you? Or how can you really see if one of you is, is loving each other? How can you really see that if you're not around people? Yeah, that goes back to the question, what is the object of your love? In order for love to exist, there has to be an object, person, thing that I love. And if you're not part of a fellowship or around other believers, you're kind of loving yourself. I don't, you know, I know, I know individuals like that. They, they, they read their Bible, they talk Christian stuff, they do, you know, they say all this stuff. But they don't go to church. And they'll gather with other people, but they're just against the institution. Mm -hmm. Other Christians, even. Yeah. Do like a couple things with another couple or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and yet there's no connection, there's no. It's just not happening. Somebody's going to say something, Derek or Michael. Derek? Okay. Yeah, one of the things about the love the brethren, one thing that would help people to understand that part as well is that Christ was our brother he's our brother if we can't love him the way he wants us to love him then we can't love anyone else yeah, yeah and, and not only must we love Christ but we display that love for Christ yeah. when we love others we love brothers and sisters in Christ because he's our brother yeah. because he came in the flesh yeah he was made like us and yet without sin it's gone there. I think this is what is so scary to me about this whole passage is the most hatred I've ever felt from anybody has not been sinners out in the world. It's been from believers who are mad at say, thus saith the Lord. And they come and do it all over again. And but those same people are still in church. They're not the ones that say, I don't want to. I mean, if I've reached that point in my life where I just, I don't want to play anymore. I'm going to blow it up. I'm going to just stay home. But God won't let me stay there. He always brings us back. No, this is how I designed it. You may not understand what I'm doing here, but mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. what I want to. 
that that is scary. Well, and and that gives you a little bit of a flavor of the weight of what his readers were feeling, because it was these were the people they were connected to, and they're gone. And these were the people that they have relationships with, and they're beginning to to drift away. And and there was a connection that you had with these people, but now it's drifting away, and you're saying, what's going on? And there's such hatred that's coming towards them from these Gnostics. And when we, th we kind of think, and there's truth to that, I think there is, because that's why John makes it, don't be surprised when the world hates you. There's an aspect of unsaved versus saved, or else he wouldn't have brought up Cain and Abel, right? But remember, this is within the, I'm, I'm going to use this word, but, but you get what I mean because there, there wasn't any of this in the first century. This is within the walls of the church. The visible church, so to speak. Yes, <laughs> the visible confessing church. Body. <laughs> the confessing body. Yeah. Prophet. Professing body, yeah. This is, these are the group of believers that they were with, and they're beginning to, the people that you were connected with, you thought you had such, there's such hatred coming from them. That's a good opportunity for us to pray with that situation or those people for the convicting of their heart, if they're not true believers, to come to salvation, if they are true believers, to be reconciled, and pray for that reconciliation with the local body, the body of yeah. believers. Yeah. Because there's, there's what we're discovering here, the, the, uh, the Gnostics, which were unbelievers, and then there's the, the real believers that encompass the whole church. But then there's also, in the case of a church split, I truly believe, there's people that are believers on both sides that just have it falling apart, and there's sin that needs to be reconciled, where that hatred of the heart comes from, from a belief. Uh, and that would be an opportunity to pray for that, for that reconciliation. So that would be a third group. And that's a, again, those are applications that we're pulling, and those are really good things for us to look at. But hopefully you just see the weight of what these believers are facing. But also understand the connection that there's, there's false teaching involved in this. It's not so much like a church split, like, well, this half of the church wants the color of the carpet to be this color. They want, it's not like that. There is a, a huge shift of, we don't believe Jesus came in the flesh anymore. So, so there's that dynamic, okay? So... So it's not so much like a, well, we, we believe, like a one church that I was involved in, this pastor went a third way of charismatic signs and wonders, and the church didn't want to go that way, so it made a huge church split. We're not talking about that. And we're talking about if this pastor no longer believed that Jesus came in the flesh. I mean, that's huge. It's bigger. Mm -hmm. So you combine that, put that, that Debbie was talking about, that the hatred and the vehemence that's coming in from someone who proclaims himself to be a Christian and then couple that with false doctrine. That can be very, very hurtful. So if you're putting yourself in their shoes, I mean, that'd be hard for them. That's why John's saying this. He wants to encourage them. So they know the one who does not love, he abides, he's abiding in death. He's staying in death. And notice 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Why does he say this? Why, why does he bring this up in verse 15? What's he relaying this back to? Cain. Yeah. He's going back to Cain. And you notice that interesting with Cain and Abel, there's, they were literal brothers. So as there's, there's such blood relation and you have that really connection with someone who's your own flesh and blood, that's how it feels with someone who's, who proclaims themselves to be a Christian and yet they're walking away. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. They outwardly conform to God's command, but that's not enough because their hearts are evil. The reality is that those who hate their fellow brothers or sisters in Christ they're murderers. And, and notice what he says, and you know, no murderer has an eternal life in life. <coughs> a person who murders is a person who hates. It describes who the person really is when they hate. He or she is a murderer. 
that these false teachers were not loving the Christian community and they were guilty of murder. And they don't have eternal life for abiding, remaining, staying, growing in them. And that's what Jesus brings up in John chapter 8, verse 44. Um, the reason why you don't believe me, you, you want to kill me. And, and, and just to keep in mind, too, you know, we read John chapter 8. When he says, uh, which one of you convicts me of sin? He who hears, he who is of God hears the words of God. This reason you will hear them because you're not of God. The context, 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 context. In, in verse 30, it says, as Jesus spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed him. So just because someone says they believe, doesn't necessarily mean that they really believe. Does that make sense to you? Actions speak louder than words. That, that's really what you can bring it down to here in Persia. In this section, 3, uh, 11, 12, and all the way to verse, well, we're going to go into that next week. We'll run out of time. In verse 16, 17, 18, uh, words, excuse me, uh, actions speak louder than words. That, that's the real problem with easy believism because I've actually heard people say, well, well sure, I'll say that prayer just in case you're wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Got that out of the way. Yeah. I can never go do whatever I want. But I said that prayer, man. I, mm-hmm. I signed that card. I turned it in. I sang three verses of just as I am. Mm-hmm. And they will say that. Oh, I know. I, I, I talked to a guy on Friday. Hey, man, I have cheese into my heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that's what you're going to get. I mean, just flat out say, hey, man, I... I just asked Jesus to my heart. And you mean not the devil? What do you say to that? Even the word. Anyone wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What? (laughs) (laughs) Other comments, thoughts, questions? important for us. Some good things to bring up is um, well, we've, we've talked about these three marks. Right? Three marks, you know, we, we love Christ. First is faith, right? Fruit. You gotta stay solid to gotta stay solid to solid doctrine. We gotta stay committed to solid doctrine. We need to be a church that's committed to solid doctrine. That needs to be a hallmark of first summer. We need to be a church that's committed to fruit. Displaying that fruit, opportunities to display that fruit, and encouraging each other to display it, stimulating one another towards love and good deeds, right? It says in Hebrews chapter ten. One stimulate each other towards doing that. And then God's going to take care of this part. <clears throat> We're staying faithful to right doctrine, to the gospel, to salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, right? And displaying that fruit. Now there's a new nature. You have a heart change. There's a change in your life to show itself in good deeds. And you'll stay faithful to the end. Yeah. 
other comments, questions, thoughts, skirmishes, disagreements, fights, mm -hmm. conflicts? <laughs> So pick it up here um, next week and kind of review a little bit. 15, 14, 15. And then we'll hit 16. So. Um. Well, that's going to go in prayer. Then again, you want to pray for us? Our Father, we thank you. Um that this love is not something that we are responsible to produce on our own. We are thankful that it is the result of your work in our hearts, giving us that new nature and bringing us from death to life so that we now love the things that we once hated and hate the things that we once loved. We thank you for your work in our hearts and that though we are in war now with the remnants of our sinful nature that are still left in our flesh, that we do have the hope that you are coming to redeem the to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify for yourself a people zealous for good works and that you are changing us from glory to glory as we see your glory we thank you for your faithfulness to us to continue changing us may your spirit have have unhindered access to our hearts and um, cause us to speak words to each other that will Provoke us to love and good deeds for your glory. Amen.